Hello, everyone. My name is Madeline Nathan. I'm the criminal justice reporter at Capital Media Atlanta. Um, we are black led. has tirelessly worked towards promoting civic engagement and empowering voices across Atlanta. Known for his ability to foster an environment of mutual respect and constructive discourse, he ensures that every voice is heard and every perspective is considered. And that is certainly important for tonight's purposes. So please join me in welcoming the distinguished moderator for tonight's panel, Rohit Mahosha.
membership. Amazing. How are we doing? I'm going to grab this off the thing. Oh, one sec. All right. How are we doing? We good? Oh, I just saw some people. Wake up. Hello. How are you? We good? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am I am so excited to, to be here. We will have this conversation. Uh, first of all, uh, this is going to be a conversation. We are going to make sure that we get as much as we can uh, to learn about these candidates, but also to learn about the role of Sheriff, uh, a role that we think we know what this role does. Uh, but we're going to find out whether we know what it does and also certainly whether the candidates know that uh, as well. Uh, so uh, it is with that that I will invite all of our candidates to join us up on stage. If we could just do one round of applause for all of them, we will have them all join us on stage. Charles Rambo, Joyce Farmer, Kurt Beasley, JT Brown. And uh, Patrick Labatt was invited to the forum. Uh, we're going to show up. Uh, we're, the show will go on. So if he. Uh, if you don't, all good. That chair will be right there for you to look at. All right. Okay, we're all busy. We're all busy. We're all busy. We're all busy. All right. How y'all doing? Oh, look, they're they're ready. Are you ready? Y'all good? I'll, I'll move my chair to see you a little bit. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation today. Uh, ground rules here, they will affirm. This is an unscripted conversation. This is not something we get into questions in advance. We uh, are going to tell you what, uh, you know, what, what question is coming next. Also, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for you to sometimes give one word answers uh, where you'll have whiteboards that you can write on. And there are times where we'll ask you to uh, tell us a little bit more. We only have limited time this evening to be able to have this conversation. And so we're going to try to get as much as we can. So if I'm interrupting or interjecting into your response, I'll keep the clock moving. But I'm going to do my best to make sure everybody has an equal amount of time. What I would ask is, which means that if there's something someone else says and you're like, i got to get in on that, make sure that you choose the right, i got to get in on that. Um, so just choose that wisely uh, because we won't have the opportunity to do that as much. We got a little less than an hour for the moderated part of this conversation, and that will be followed by questions and answers. So for y'all, as they said, there are places where you can write those questions. Uh, remember, questions end with question marks. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're able to do that. As much as we would love for you to tell us your story, uh, we hope you will run for something one day so we can hear it in its full entirety one day. So fair, fair rules. We good? Yes? Good? Excellent. Okay. So. I'm going to take a little bit of a journey throughout tonight just to make sure that we are all on the same page. But before we get there, uh, we want to know a little bit more about you. Uh, we can go to your website and uh, we, can, uh, we can see your flyers, and some of you have more of them than others. Uh, but I want to ask you why are you doing this? Why, why public service for you? What is it specifically about public service? Where does that come from? Someone in your life that drove that? Quickly, 30 seconds to a minute. What, why public service uh, for you? And we'll start with me. Good evening, everyone. And ACLU, thank you for this important conversation. I am James J.T. Brown. I am a Morehouse graduate. I went from Morehouse to the jailhouse. I have a master's degree. I have a doctorate degree, ADB. I am a business owner. I'm going to let you get to all your accolades. I want you to answer the question, though, which is, uh, why are you doing this? Where does public service come from for you? Certainly, it's not just school, right? No, my, my DNA. Okay, how do, you, how do you get into your DNA? When I was a kid, I always wanted to be law uh, enforcement. Okay, so my mother was a social worker. My father also was a public school. We also work for the YMCA, a lot of community service. That's why I'm doing it. We're raised with family. Thank you. All right. 
next, uh, why, why are you doing this? Why public service for you? Where does it come from? in public service is simply because growing up I wanted to always work with young adults to deter children from getting into the criminal justice system and so I decided to join the sheriff's office so I can get ahead of doing that and so that's why I'm in public service because the same reason that the ACLU is doing this I don't want to see people incarcerated okay thank you uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Labatt, what, why, are, why are you doing this work? Why public service for you? First of all, thank you. Thank you for moderating. As always, thank you for, to the ACLU. This is how I was born and bred. I'm from here. St. Paul of the Cross, across Frederick Douglass High School, Clark Atlanta University. And it is what we have done as a family. It is what we will continue to do. And as I st am very humbled to be the 28th Sheriff of Fulton County, it's time to finish the job. It's time to continue to do the work. Got it. Thank you. For you, Joyce, why, why, why public service? Where does that come from for you? It comes from my career started in 2018, excuse me, 1989. And I have always, the passion that I have for the community and for people within the community, that's why I started wanted to go into law enforcement. I didn't choose that career in effort just to lock up people. I just figured once I crossed their path, maybe I can give them a different direction or a different way of thinking because it's other options in life other than just being incarcerated. So that was my plan is to con make a contact with someone to change their life in reference instead of coming to the, you know, to jail. Okay, thank you. How about for you? Why, why uh, public service? Well, for public service for me is, is that I never really intended on doing it. It was a calling. And you can tell the calling by how a person carries the mission once they have begun to fulfill into that role. I've been carrying the pain of this agency for over 34 years. I'm the most visible person that has been on the forefront of helping to resolve issues in the most fantastic way that God has allowed me to do that. So when you carry the pain, you also carry the purpose, but you also carry the plan. And that's what I'm here to talk about, real public service of what's going to be done. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we're a little bit more grounded in why you're, you're here. For many of you, it's personal, it sounds like. There is some personal calling uh, or there is something that happened in your life or people in your life that you have seen that are driven you to do this. So this is the perfect time to bring out our whiteboards. Uh, so you have whiteboards with you, if you can bring that out. Um, for, the, for the audience as they're getting ready, uh, you know, we asked a lot of folks, like, what do you, what do you think the sheriff does? Uh, like, what, what is the sheriff? Uh, I actually just recorded someone right before that. I was in a, a car coming here. I was like, what do you think the sheriff does? And they're like, that's the, that's the top cop, right? Uh, and then someone else said, the sheriff, oh, isn't that that guy who lives right over there? I think uh, uh, another person, I've never heard of this role. Like, I've seen it in the movies. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion in the public about what is the sheriff? What, is it actually, what does this role actually do? So we're going to together talk about the role of the sheriff. Um, we will get into the latter half of this conversation will be about jails and uh, one of the main roles of the sheriff is to manage the jails. But I want you to write down what beyond the management of the jail and the people who are in the jails, what else is very important about the role of sheriff that you want to focus on? What else beyond jails do you want to focus on? And y'all should be thinking, what would I want them to focus on beyond jails? What is important about their role beyond jails? And luckily for y'all, y'all got cheat sheets. You should see in your seat. You can see some of the role. And it looks like this is mostly a 25 and under crowd, so you wouldn't be eligible to run uh, yet. But just take a look at those. All right, so I wanna see what y'all wrote. Um, if you could, uh, we'll turn it around one by one. Um, we'll, start, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Pat. What, what for you is the most important role outside of the management of the jails? Protecting our community. Okay, protecting our community. What do you mean when you say that? So 
holistically, we have to understand that disproportionately, and I say this all the time, we had a high of 3,700 individuals that were incarcerated when I came into the job. Most of them looked like me. And so we have a, we have to focus on what that looks like, the root causes for it, and certainly how do we change that and change people's lives at the same time. Got it. Joyce, for you, what, what is the most important role outside of, and, and y'all can stop writing, but uh, what's the most important role outside of management of the jails? Outside of that is to ensure safety for everyone, both staff and the inmates, and especially the mental health. So those that are incarcerated with mental health, to make sure that they are classified properly so they won't end up in the general population. That way they can receive the treatment that they need. So that would be something you would do outside of the jail system? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's okay. Well, yeah, pretty much as far as the mental health, educating the community and getting involved with the community to, to educate them on mental health, establish with programs that's already out there, partnering with them to come together as a community Got it. so that we can address mental health. Okay, thank you. How about for you? Yes. Oh. Uh, the most paramount duty of the sheriff is consistent with Georgia's constitution, and that is to protect life, liberty, and property. That is the foremost responsibility of the state that is passed down to the sheriffs of each county. So what does that mean for that you? Like when you say very specifically, like I'm, you're the next sheriff, I gotta manage the jails. The other thing that's really important to me, yes, life, liberty, and property. But what does that mean for you? What that means is, is that when you're protecting life, you're not just protecting life outside of the community, you're protecting life inside of a jail that's experiencing high right but i'm talking about outside the jail what outside is jail. yes i don't want y'all to even use the word jail in your response sure. uh, i want to know uh, we know that the role of the jail is important to the sheriff we're going to get to that i want to know outside of that role i'm hearing very broad answers so far um, but we'll come back um, what 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 about at the end what for you is outside of jails what what is the role main role of of the sheriff that you want to focus on mental health Okay, wow. explain that. How are you going to do that outside of the jails? Well, I was in the law enforcement division where I worked a unit picking up mentally challenged individuals on what's called a um, 1013, which is given from the probate court. So I would like to have a program where the loved ones are educated on the system of how to come down to probate court and take out the appropriate paperwork and also understand that they are doing something that no one wants to do to their loved one. So that's public education for you yes. and for families. Got it. Okay, great. Kirk? Sir, divert education. Okay. Can you say that into the microphone so sorry. we can hear you? I'm so sorry. Don't apologize. You're good. Deter, Go divert, educate, and make better. Okay. Pick one of those because I don't know what any of those words mean. Okay. Um, I want you to pick one and tell me what is it that you specifically are going to do as the role of the sheriff to do one of those things? So deter anybody from even coming to jail. Get okay, involved how would you do that? Get involved with the community. Okay, how? Uh, get involved with churches. Okay. Uh, neighborhood planning units. And any volunteers, businesses, whoever it is, whatever we need to do as a village to keep the young people from coming into custody. Got it, okay. So we're all gonna pay attention to the fact sheet that we got. There's a lot of roles and responsibilities of, of the sheriff. Um, we got folks who are, are, are gonna be thinking about those roles and responsibilities. Um, what I wanna ask about next is uh, one of the things that the sheriff is called by the, by the state. The state says each county uh, is supposed to elect its own sheriff. That sheriff ends up becoming the chief law enforcement officer. That's the term that they use, the chief law enforcement officer. Now, if you're in a smaller part of Georgia uh, where you may not have, your city may not have its own police department, um, you, the, the sheriff's office may actually play a lot of roles around law, law enforcement. However, in Fulton County, uh, law enforcement is often either a partnership or a voluntarily deferred service to a number of other agencies. In Atlanta alone, there's 25 plus agencies uh, that uh, we partner with, that the Fulton County Sheriff's Office may partner with. What I want you to write down um, is, what do you think is the most important partnership 
that Fulton County has with one of those, name the one of those 25 agencies that we have a partnership with, and why is it the most important, either because it needs to change or because it's so good that it needs to stay the same. So name the agency uh, and tell us why, why, what we need to do with that relationship, either double down on it or change it completely. So once again, as they're writing, there are 25 different, 25 plus different agencies that they work with. It's not just Fulton County that is doing that enforcement. So we're gonna find out who they think we need to have stronger relationships with. All right, flip them over. It should just be a quick, uh, quick response. Um, all right, we'll start with you this time. Courts. Okay. Courts is the most important. Okay, that's the most important law enforcement agency? That's the most important judicial function that has to be stepped up in order for our law enforcement systems to work. Understood. That's a different question, though. What I would like you to do, and I'll come back to you, is pick a law enforcement agency that you would want, to, because we're deferring these relationships to them. Now, there is a very important relationship between the, the sheriff's office and the courts, but I want to ask about the relationship with other law enforcement agencies. So I'll come back to you. Um, Joyce, would you like? Okay, Fulton County PD. Why is Fulton County PD the most important relationship? And if you could use your microphone, please. I know we made it hard, but trying to hold a lot of things. Yes, uh, I would think it's important to join, for us to collaborate together and to work as one unit. If you have a share, my personal opinion, you don't need a PD, Fulton County PD. So if we can work together and be one unit, that's what I would like to take place. Got it. Okay, thank you. Pat? So you are, are correct. There are 15 different municipalities with over 25 different police departments, right. but our federal partners play a much larger role than people understand. So as many fugitives as we have that flee to Atlanta, as many individuals that mean us no good, we have partnered with our federal U.S. Marshals, the FBI, Secret Service. So the federal government has many more opportunities to help us become heavily resourced and make sure we go after those bad actors. Okay, so, but of the local 25 agencies for you, what of those relationships are most important? Well, again, to, to your point, it is about building relationships and we have them across the board from yes. the World Congress Center to the Atlanta Police Department. Great. And so there's no one agency. It's a multi-pronged approach. Okay, um, Curtis, for you, what, what agency is most important? Atlanta Police. Atlanta Police. Atlanta Police. So explain to us why Atlanta Police is the most important relationship that we need to talk about as in the role of sheriff. Atlanta Police would be the agency that brings the most arrests to the jail. So I would like to partner and meet with them to find out what it is that we can do together to deter some of those arrests. Uh, maybe give citations instead of bringing all of the arrestees to the jail. Got it. Okay. And for you? Yes, sir. It would be APD, because when I was in the law enforcement division of the sheriff's office, I was on many task force where APD asked the sheriff for us to assist. And when we assist, we did a lot of public safety issues. Uh, on Metropolitan, just before the Olympics, I was on that task force where we cleaned up the prostitution rings over there. Also, when you had a traffic problem up in Buckhead, we were the sheriff's office assisted in a task force to clean up the unruly young teenagers driving recklessly. Okay, understood. Okay, so now we have a little bit of a grounding on there's some law enforcement that the uh, Fulton County Sheriff's Office does. Uh, they do defer some of that out. Some of it does come in federally uh, as well. Um, the All of you but one answered uh, yes to this question, but I wanna see if your answers are consistent with what you wrote. So I'm gonna have you erase, and this is a yes or no question, which is, I uh, particularly want to talk about um, the, uh, the, the fact that Homeland Security is one of those federal agencies, so I was getting to that question. The first one was about local, but for, there are federal agencies that sometimes tell us, like, we would like to defer some of the responsibility uh, of, of uh, national agencies to the county. That is a relationship that exists. One of those relationships which is not uh, existing now but has been brought up as potentially would, would reprise and, and be a part of the relationship with Fulton County is the relationship with ICE. Uh, the ACLU has done a lot of, of study around 
uh, the harm that happens when uh, when the national government or the federal government uh, puts uh, ICE responsibilities on to Fulton County. If that came up, would you be supportive of working with the Department of Homeland Security um, on taking on some of the responsibilities of ICE, or would you uh, not be a part of uh, that response? Do you not believe the sheriff's office should be involved in that? Um, so it's a yes or no. Do you believe, yes, we should be involved in that, or no, we should not be involved in uh, immigration services? All right, if you could flip it over. I can't, uh, I th just one word answer. So yes, yes, oh, okay, no, no, uh, no, what is that? No, no, okay, got it, got it. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, so for those of you who said yes, we should be involved in that. Um, I think it was, it was you and you, right? Um, so, oh, yes, excuse me, you, uh, Joyce. So, uh, Joyce, can you tell us why would you support us taking on the responsibility of, uh, of ICE's, uh, you know, what ICE is doing more nationally and federally? Okay, the reason I say that I will su support is due to the fact we do understand that there's a lot of immigrants over here that's illegally. And to keep everyone safe, you mean undocumented? So, un yeah, undocumented. So to prevent anyone from being hurt or murdered, I just figured if they're here and shouldn't be, if, if it's not documented that they should be over here, we should let them know and work together as a law enforcement unit. Okay, got it. And how about for you? For me, I agree, yes, and it's not so much a cooperation with federal. We have current law that is getting ready to get passed here in Georgia that's going to put it on the onus of sheriffs to be able to enforce immigration at the state level. I want to take particular pause to this that undocumented is not specific to Hispanic. Undocumented is related to anyone that comes into the country that is not going through processes that we would go through other countries. Now, ending on this, it's unfair that we have almost 500, 600 black men up on the floor that don't get the same opportunity for equal release that some of the community proponents would want us to do in just releasing undocumented persons on cash bails and recognizance bonds. We need to give those same young men out there at 901 Rice Street. I'm going to separate those two conversations on whether we're going to talk about black men or folks who are undocumented, uh, but we can, we can get to that conversation for sure because we could go down a rabbit hole with that. Um, all right, so I want to uh, now get us to, uh, in a, you know, we have other relationships that we have with either the city um, and, and others. There is, um, there, as you may know, there is a police training facility that is being built um, and uh, constructed by the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, which is in a, has a lease agreement uh, with uh, the city of Atlanta um, to build that within, within DeKalb County. But also Fulton County um, has a, a public safety training facility that it is also opening up this year. So we got, we got a bunch of these coming up, right? Um, so what I want to know is uh, it, it sounds like y'all have the ability to go into partnership and relationship with the city or with federal agencies or with other, um, uh, other enforcement agencies. If yes or no, if the city of Atlanta uh, wanted to use the, uh, you already wrote yes, <laughs> if, if they wanted to use uh, the police training facility in Fulton County rather than constructing an additional one, is that a partnership? Oh, now you're erasing it, I see. Okay, great. That's why you gotta hear the whole full question. Uh, so uh, so if, if would you actually go uh, encourage them to enter a partnership with Fulton County to build a joint training facility as opposed to the county and the city having separate training facilities? And then the second part of that question is, uh, would you rather they come to Fulton County's facilities or would you rather Fulton County be a part of the police training facility or cop city? So it's a yes or no on whether y'all would want those facilities to be combined. And then the second would be, would you rather your folks train there or their folks train with train in your, uh, your facility? Okay, 
great. Let's say uh, yes or no, first part. Okay. So all candidates would want to combine those efforts. Uh, and then for you, you said two come to us. Okay, got it. You would want Fulton County to, to manage that, that process. How about for you, Kurt? Could I say it wouldn't matter? It doesn't, well, you no. Know, oh, I can't? Well, you shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> then they can come to Fulton County. Okay, got it. How about for you? The answer is yes, and it is an equal partnership that should take place, and we've actually asked for that. So you asked for them to come to the Fulton we, County? We've asked, since it's already, we've broken ground, the state-of-art state facility should be built or at least out of the ground by December. Why would we build another facility? Let's just use what's already there. So you're saying to not construct the Fulton County facility, instead, or you're saying because you've already broken ground on Fulton County, they should come to y'all. No, it's the other way around. Other way around. So, so the city's you already broken ground. The city. They're scheduled to be on track in December or Got the it. end of the end of the year. Why build another facility? Got it. The facility is large enough to, to encompass two agencies. Yep. Got it. Okay. And how about for you, Tracy? I said yes. And as far as partnering, as far as a neutral spot, whether or not they come to Fulton County, if they come to Fulton County, I feel that they should contribute to the the cost. Got it. Got it. But you would have them come to Fulton County rather than build a Unless they can facility. do it on the line. Well, if it's all wherever it has already started, my thing is just go ahead and complete it. But Got we it. still partnership. Okay. And how about for you? For me as a senior instructor uh, that actually teaches on law enforcement subjects at academies and yeah. also being sought about to comment on what's going on out there at the road with the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, not a cop city. Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, what I would love to see is, is that the state comes in and add a metro division of the Georgia Public Safety Training Center. Let it fall up under the state so that everyone in the metro area, we have unique needs that need to be Got serviced uh, based upon what we provide. Got it. Okay. Um, moving to another part, which is about partisanship. So uh, the sheriff does not have to run with a political party. They can choose to run with a political party. And there is a political party that most sheriffs uh, have represented throughout the, the, throughout the last 100 years. Um, if you are representing a political party, can you please write that political party on your whiteboard and show it to the audience? So we will see what you got. We can probably know from the first letter what you're about to write. So I see a D, D, D. D and W. Uh, what does W stand for? <laughs> this must have been a good plant question. It stands for write in, and it's a nonpartisan position. Rain the sheriff's in. office should not be a partisan uh, 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 office. It needs to be just as much with judges. Got it. We so we have four folks who are running as Democrats, one who is running. As rain, right, uh, in, yes, right rain, in, right rain, in, rain, yeah, rain, right rain, in, rain, right in, right, right, W R T E, okay. right in, Charles rain, Rambo, right, yes, November fifth. Okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it. hopefully you might be able to manage. Got it. All right. So, okay, cool. Yes, we have men on this panel. That's true. Um, all right. So the next thing that I want to talk about, which is actually perfect uh, segue, um, is I want to talk about women, uh, which is. Uh, there, we have only had uh, one female sheriff uh, in the history of Fulton County. Uh, Jackie Berry was elected uh, sheriff, served, uh, excuse, yeah. Barrett, excuse me, uh, Jackie Barrett was elected, served three terms, uh, and, but ultimately uh, was uh, uh, then Governor Perdue, uh, put put a, a little bit of a, an inserted himself into the sheriff's office and said, because there was reverse discrimination, uh, there was reverse discrimination where there were white uh, white officers that said that they were being treated or uh, white sh uh, deputy sheriffs that said that they were being treated unfairly by the office uh, and that she was discriminating in her hiring. We have not had a black uh, woman sheriff since then. Um, do you think, and this question is for Joyce uh, and Kurt, is it, are the standards different uh, for 
a woman who may be running for sheriff versus a man? Can you say that? Sure. You can go ahead. Okay, I think as a woman, we do have to raise the bar higher the fact that we're not a male. People seem to listen to a man more so than a female, other than we get in certain comments about how we might look or whatever. So we have to step our game up. But I don't, now it's, things have changed because now there's a lot of females in lead positions. So as far as I'm going to be firm, I don't get caught up in situations as far as I'm going to be able to do the job and get the job done. So as a female, I don't think that the job is not for a female. We can do anything that a man can do. Yeah. How about for you, sir? Is, that, is it, uh, are there different standards that the public sets uh, for women who are running for the office of sheriff as opposed to men? I, th I think there are. <clears throat> I think the public has a thought that a man can run the sheriff's office better and I don't know why that is, but the answer to that question is yes. I think there are different standards set. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> um, I want to ask, uh, Pat, you are currently, you, you are playing the role of sheriff, right? You are elected to the role of sheriff. Uh, how do you think about gender inside of uh, your current, like how would you describe, and we could run the data, on what g the gender makeup of your department looks like today and whether there is gender equity inside of your department and where do you think you could potentially improve if you were reelected? So first of all, thank you. I'm not playing the role of sheriff. I am the sheriff. Yeah, I said I elected. I, I, I want to yeah. be, be clear. Uh, and I say this all the time and people should know. I was raised by a single black female. So I'm, I am very intentional about making sure opportunities internally exist. And if you look at IACP and you look at the year 3030, they're trying to have 30% of the workforce to include executive leadership be part of what law enforcement looks like. We've already exceeded that. We're 35% and 45% at higher levels. So our goal is to remain fair, firm, consistent, but also we brought in the University of Georgia to do all the promotional testing. That way we remove ourselves from it, the cream rises to the top, and we're very intentional about making sure that everyone has an opportunity. Um, JT, for you, uh, it, do you see, uh, is there a gender equity issue in, uh, like you have, you said you've, you've played different roles within the department. Do you think that there is a gender equity issue? And if yes, how would you address it? Well, I was fortunate enough to work under Jackie Berry, who was a great sheriff, great administrator. So she's the one that changed the culture of the sheriff's office by bringing in more females. And let me tell you, I take any one of those females with me any day to anywhere in Fulton County because they do the job. So, no. Okay. How about for you? For me, I'm not going after gender equity. I'm looking for competent men and women who can come in and get the job done. With that, we have to maybe do some uh, impact hiring uh, to try to equal out that playing field. But I see a lot of my former cadets that are sitting here right now. They know that I never judge them according to their race. I judge them according to their skill, knowledge, and ability to get the job done. And that's do you think there is a difference that for uh, women who are in the sher sheriff's department or in law enforcement? Is there a different treatment at all? that we need to overcome or that- Oh, by all means. And that comes strictly from the head. Got it. That okay. comes from the head. Okay, great. So uh, the next thing that I wanna talk about is uh, your existing relationship with uh, the, uh, the current board of commissioners. Uh, we saw in the recent news um, that uh, there is a lot of love and respect, it seems like, between the commissioners among themselves. Uh, we've, and I say that in jest because we've seen shouting matches. Uh, you know, I, I think that I, we were doing a game inside of our office on who said it. Was it our staff's children or the board of commissioners? Uh, and it is, we saw people yelling obscenities at one another. The decorum seems off. And that decorum uh, impacts people's trust with, uh, with not just the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, but that also affects anybody. 
who works within this Fulton County uh, County system. So I would like to know, what is your relationship like currently with the existing Board of Commissioners uh, on a scale of one to five, five being extremely strong, uh, one being extremely weak? Uh, what would you say your relationship with the existing Board of Commissioners is one to five? And if there is a particular commissioner that uh, you believe your relationship is, uh, is maybe a little dicey with, uh, you can write that down um, as well, because I'd love to know more about that. <laughs> okay, let's turn it around. All right, we got five, five, all right, five, three, three. And wh wh what do you have, Pat? Are you writing down all the names of the people you have a dicey relationship with? Okay, Ellis Pitts, Khadija, and Thorne. Okay, and those and are it's all a two point five. Okay, got it. Two point five. Not not very strong. Okay, so you don't have a great relationship right now with the board of commissioners. Got it. Uh, uh, we'll come back to that if we have a little bit of time. But I wanted to get a sense of where those relationships sit. Neither here nor there on that. Um, the next question that I have for you, I want to get into. Uh, I want to get into money. I want to get into a little bit of money. So, without looking at your fact sheet, y'all can cheat for sure. Uh, but without looking at your fact sheet, um, what is the size of the sheriff's budget? What is the size of the sheriff's budget? What is the size of the sheriff's allocated budget by the board of commissioners this year? Okay, don't, don't, don't show it yet, don't show it yet. Wanna make sure, uh, not, all right. Okay, turn it around. All right, 190, 140, 146, 256, 145-ish. Okay, got it. So we have to, there's the auction, uh, we, we have other funds that also feed into uh, the commissioner's office, so I had multiple answers, can be true, uh, but it is, uh, the, from the general fund, it's 146 million, uh, and then there are additional funds that come from a variety of different pots that are there. Uh, so it is, it, that was about double, um, but I, I want to now have a, my next question about the budget itself is where, um, where does the majority of that money go? Where does the majority of that money go? So we got 140, Six million dollars that is given to the sheriff's office. Where's the money go? Where's the majority? The largest chunk of that money. Okay, all right, turn it around. Personnel, personnel, medical, what is that? Medical center. Salaries, training, promotions, gas. Is it, oh. You got to fill up the cars, right? Yes. Yeah. So the majority of that money uh, is going to uh, yes personnel, but to go where? What? What are we funding that with? What? Where? What are we? Salaries where? There's a specific place. There's a specific allocation in the budget that that money is going. Where's it going? I say it's going to personnel, but it's going towards the staff. Okay, staff of what? Of the jail. Okay, which jail? Fulton County Jail. Okay, got the it. Deputies at the Fulton County Jail get most of the, the um, um, personnel. Does everyone, uh, can everyone write down based on this question, where does, where does the majority of the money go? What specific uh, line item is there for the sheriff's office? Where does the majority of the money go? I think they're going to get it this time. Here we go. All right. Turn it around. Inmates, court jail, salaries for jail, Rice Street jail, and the jail deputy salaries. Okay. All right. We have some homework to do, but the, it is the Rice Street. It is the Rice Street Jail. The Rice Street Jail gets the largest allocation of dollars. 
Yes, that includes salaries. It also includes facilities. It also includes, uh, you know, folks who have to work on, on, on the jail it, itself. So what I wanted to ask you is that the department of the sheriff received an $11 million increase last year. Um, where, where do you believe that that money should go? If you were able to move $11 million from the existing budget, where would you put it? Write it down. If you were to move $11 million, where would you put it? Uh, we're going to start with you. Go ahead. Me? Yes. Yeah. Repair of the jail. The repair of the jail. Say more. Oh. Say more oh. on that. Jail repair. What do you mean? Repairing the jail so that um, it can, the things that are being used in there to harm other detainees, you know, the deaths that we've had. So I would um, use the money on repairing the structure of the jail. How about for you, Joyce? Main, you wrote I maintaining. Maintain the jail. As far as, um, I would take that money to. You could speak into the microphone, please. Yep. I would use that money to invest in possibly renovating or adding on a wing to the jail. Okay, so you would want to renovate or add a wing to the jail. Right. Got it. Okay. How about for you, Pat? So first of all, there is a sixteen million dollar jail blitz project. The, it, the actual, if there were $11 million there, it needs to go to the teams that actually work at the jail. Okay. And so your numbers are a little skewed in as much as there was not an $11 million increase. There were some increases where medical was moved under the sheriff's office. The jail blitz project was moved under the sheriff's office out of non-agency funds. And because of that, it appeared to be an increase. It was actually a 3% decrease in the budget. You think so what you're saying is that the amount of money that the sheriff's office was actually less than Correct. what it had, but it was having to take on more responsibility, Correct. which cost more money? Correct. Okay, we'll check that. Um, yes, JT. The upkeep, of the, jail. the upkeep of the jail. Okay, anything you wanted to add to the folks who said repair or maintenance? Yeah, repair and maintenance, make sure it's a safe um, environment. And here's where, again, you have to come to public policy expertise in the sheriff's office. Ex excuse me, infrastructure of the jail is not the sheriff's responsibility. That is solely upon the county commissioner. So any monies that comes to me is for operational purposes. And we're going to ensure that we get a qualified uh, uh, workforce, ensuring that they get the best training possible. But none of my budget will be going towards infrastructure. We got to put that squarely statutorily on the county commissioners. Got it. So I'm going to move us now to just talk about the jail. A few questions, and then we're going to move to, to public. Y'all doing okay out here? You good? Yes? Good. All right. Um, so want to ask us a little bit about the jail. So the jail is in a very important part of the conversation because one of the main roles that the sheriff does play is the management, but also the safety of the people who are in the jails. Uh, themselves. So I want to ask you, uh, we, we, we have been dinged time and time and time again. So it's, we, we look back, we have 20 years of receipts of either the Department of Justice or uh, an injunction being filed or a complaint being written or an academic paper coming out that the, the, the conditions of the jail have not been uh, have not been safe, and in some cases have not been humane. Um, there is, uh, we want to make it clear that the role of the sheriff is not to determine uh, who comes into the jail, but once they are in the jail, they are the, the sheriff's responsibility. Uh, so I want to talk about this issue that all of you have mentioned, uh, which was around overcrowding, uh, which is around uh, the, us not having enough of enough jail beds for folks. How are you actually uh, planning to address that if you were sheriff? In, in your first 90 days, you come in. What is the approach that you would take uh, to address that? Joyce, for you. 
my fir- in my first 90 days, my first approach is to make sure that it's safe for all the staff. And How would you do that? Well, as far as hiring individuals that qualified and properly trained them so that we can fully staff the facility. Because it has to be staffed in order for it to operate. Okay. So that's what I will focus on. Is staffing the existing facility. Correct. Okay, got it. How about for you, Kurt? Will you ask that question again? Yes. So for you, your first 90 days, uh, you mentioned that overcrowding is an issue that you care a lot about. So what would you do in the first 90 days in order to address overcrowding, given that the role of the sheriff can't say, well, we're not going to take folks. You've got to take the folks that you're given. What, what, what are you actually willing or able to do uh, to make sure that you address the overcrowding issue? Well, to address the overcrowding issue, we'll have to get involved with all the justice departments, the judges, the case managers. Right, but that's, gonna, that's a long game, right? I'm saying your first 90 days, mm-hmm. what are you going to do to actually address this issue? The overcrowding. Yes. Immediately. It, well, 90 days. 90 days. I would meet with the police agencies to see if they cannot bring additional arrestees to the jail to slow that process down. We will assess the jail to ensure safety of the detainees. We have to hire people to keep them safe, all at the same time with getting the paperwork from the courts and getting the detainees released as quickly as possible to get the population down. Got it. Okay. How about for you? Well, how would you, first 90 days, how would you reduce the jail? First 90 days is first we got to stop being a lowercase s sheriff and be a capital S sheriff. And that means you are a check and balance. You represent the sovereignty of the state and coming into the criminal justice system and just as much getting with the judges and the prosecutors for proper case management, such as when we dealt with in 2009 to 2016 in reducing jail population by identifying what cases you know, could be tried, what cases could not, and what cases were eligible for bond. I agree with ACLU uh, when they did their white paper study on the overcrowding there at the jail. What you need is for the sheriff to get more involved by getting these folks down and have the judges to stop further noticing cases. Well, how would they do that? They would, they would go well, and they, they can't tell the courts what to do. No, I mean, we, we can't tell them what to do, but at the same time, if I have to... Uh, uh, exercise my executive authority as sheriff and start doing some bond releases for those cases that are eligible to go, then I'm going to exercise my power as well. Okay, gotcha. How about for you, J.D.? I first would have my classification department at the jail see who is eligible to be on a signer on bond. That's what I would do first. Next, I would talk to the local police agencies and ask them, could they do a copy of charges so those individuals who do need to come to my jail can come to court. That's where I would start first. But, but how would you, pre- I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, right? You, y'all have been doing this longer than I have. Ultimately, the, the courts are going to send you, I, I mean, uh, of course, we want to see changes across the board. But what can the sheriff specifically do in order to address overcrowding as opposed to asking another agency to do something? Is that our only recourse, is to ask someone else to change no, their behavior? No, as I stated, we can have my classification system check out to see who is eligible to be assigned on bond. Okay. And who um, other detainees in there who might not be a risk, where we can check out their addresses to see where they are so we can have uh, constant contact with them gotcha. for, for them to come to court. Okay. Pat, th- this is your opportunity. to. This is going to be the thing you hear throughout the entirety of this campaign. It is across, I read all everyone's submissions. Uh, you, you, you're going to be asked this question. We have a overpopulated jail. People are sick and tired of hearing the issue. When people, when the ACLU actually talked to, uh, you know, public residents, when they, when they started to see that, they all felt, you know, over 50% of folks felt that the jail was an issue. And when they found out, because not many of them knew, that the sheriff is actually responsible for the jail, it impacts their relationship and their uh, trust of that sheriff. So I want to give you the opportunity. Number one, can you stay, say clearly whether we have 
an overcrowding problem today, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, what are you doing about it? Um, and if the and why should we, and and then I'll ask you a follow up. Yeah. So first of all, yes, we do have an overcrowding issue. And if you recall, when I came into office, we had 3,700 individuals that were incarcerated, 600 of them sleeping on the floor. What do we do? We created an inmate advocacy unit. That unit focuses on going through daily the routine of understanding why a person has been in jail for so long. Right now we have three people that have been in jail 10 years or longer. And it is a pretrial facility. But what we were able to do because of the success of the inmate advocacy unit is partner with the judges, the DA, the solicitor, and we, they came up, and the, and the public defender, they came up with consent bonds, over 500 consent bonds for people that had been there three, four, five years, longer than they would have had they been sentenced. Today, the population is 2,800. There's no one sleeping on the floor. We did outsource to several different areas because it is imperative. As many doors as the facility is as well-warned or outlived its life cycle, we have to treat people humanely and get them off the floor. Do you think that the critique of the sheriff's office today, which each of these candidates, many of whom are running on the critique, that the sheriff's office has not done enough to solve this problem. Is there any validity to that critique where you may have gotten something wrong that you're hoping to correct if you are reelected? So first let me say in a county as large as Fulton County with 1.2 1 1 .2 million people, I applaud everybody. There are five people that are courageous enough to run for this office. But I will tell you there are also four people that got it wrong because every single day our focus is service and making sure those individuals that have an opportunity to go back to court. I'll give you an example. When we took over, there were over 300 people that had court production orders from judges. So we went to the judges exercising that constitutional authority and said, if you're not ready to go to trial in two weeks, those individuals are going back to the state. We went to the judges and said, if you're not ready to process these cases ultimately when it comes to mental health, Let's get, let's partner with Emory, let's partner with Georgia State, let's partner with, with Grady Hospital and figure out how to get this competency level up so people can go to court. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm wondering though is, is this is an opportunity for, uh, for the con constructive critique, right? Which is, I'm asking you, is, there, is it that every single critique that is coming uh, your way on the sheriff's office handling of overcrowding that it is just not, it's not contextualized or they don't get it or they don't know? Or is there something that your, your office really needs to improve on um, that people can say, okay, at least there's a willingness to admit that something is going wrong? So there's always room for improvement. So what's That's an period. example of something that and you would the say? The inmate advocacy unit is that example. We actually, we brought in and recruited some top talent to actually go after and understand what's the going root on cause. over there. I don't know what's happening because she knows that we partner to make this happen. Okay. See, I, I'm a I proponent, I'm a, you proponent. Will, you will I'm a proponent of bringing in my biggest critics. We sat down with anybody to include the DOJ. I reached out to the I'm DOJ. Not, I'm not smart enough so, to understand the issue. So can you tell me what it the is? What systemically, the issue? systemically, the system is broken. Okay, to your point that. earlier, the judges have an opportunity to hear cases. Sure. There are not enough public defenders. 80 to 85% of the individuals incarcerated are represented by the public defender's office. Yep. It is disparate at best. But what we did do was create an environment where PAD had an office at the back door. And because PAD has an opportunity to, and the public defender's office at the back door, to interview individuals, since October when we created the program, We've released 93 people into the care of, and Is custody PAD of PAD. Is a part of the sheriff's office budget? They're, no, they're not a part. Of, well, they're part of the county budget. Okay. So if you recall, the city and the county have funded part of PAD. Got it. And so we gave them office space so that those individuals that do not belong in jail yep. are able to get out. Got it. Okay. Let me get you, and then I'll, I'll get you. R respectively and objectively asking, I heard him say that four people got it wrong. Is he talking about either one of their candidates or 
someone in his administration. I'll let you, I'm not here to interpret. Uh, okay, well then let me say it this way. Let me say it this way, and I'm going to yep. ask the sheriff yep. directly. And then let me move to the next And question. it's not a debate, but at the end of the day, did you start the advocacy uh, units after the death started happening? Or did you start at the day that you came into office? Okay, we're going to keep that rhetorical, and we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to it. Yes, go ahead. I just want to add that, as Sheriff Lobot said, I am the person who spearheaded the MA advocacy unit, so I was very involved in getting that jail population down. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I want to move. I got two last questions, then we got to open it up for the audience. We're running a little bit, uh, a little bit behind. So, uh, I want to actually talk about. I, I want to talk about the fact that there have been deaths inside of this jail, right? And we cannot flippantly just say, well, a few people died, but look how many people we kept alive, right? Um, these folks have names, these folks have families, um, and we've had 10 people in the last year alone be impacted inside of, uh, inside of jail conditions. So I'm actually not interested in the debate or the argument on, uh, on whether you think that's a problem or not, okay? It is a problem. And I think it is the core issue that's going to define whether people want to uh, elect, the, who they want to elect as the next sheriff. So my question is, what are you specifically able to do inside of the jail system to ensure that there is not a single death, not a single death, if you are sheriff during your term. Not a single death. What is something that you feel we have not done or that we could do? And for you, Pat, it's something that you want to do um, because we all got to get this right. We can keep fighting about what we've, we've already done debate on what is or what isn't. But I want to know what you're going to do because this issue, at least for me, even as the moderator here, will decide for me, I think, who it is that I, I would like to vote for for sheriff because to me that is not only a national stain um, but it is it is remarkable that it has happened in our system um, and so I, I would like for you to comment on that what is the specific thing that you would do to ensure that doesn't happen and if it happens again would you resign go ahead That's seismic, my friend. Uh, at the end of the day, you cannot realistically say there will be no deaths. People come to jail with uh, pre-existing conditions. Let me, let me qualify, let me qualify sure, that, then, please. just so that everybody, not I don't get the same response from everybody. Preventable death. Thank you. Preventable Pre death. Preventable death. Again, that's why I said that you have to have proper competent staff. You got to have people who are so, well trained. So you, for you, it's staffing. It's staffing, but it also means that you also have to have accountability. As I introduce. So explain accountability to me. Sure. Give me something. Uh, okay, stop for a second. Sure. Y'all got to give me something specific because I'm just walking out of here, like I feel like I'm just reading your websites. I need something specific. You are going to be our sheriff. I am very frustrated about this particular role because I do not understand how this happens in our system. Maybe I'm ignorant, maybe I'm not smart enough, maybe I'm not capable enough and I don't understand uh, all of that. But I think the general public, whoever we are, we, this, is, this is a driving issue for this. I want a specific intervention or solution, if you are sheriff, that you will introduce to ensure that preventable deaths are a non-factor in your administration. Thank you, and I'll finish it out. From 2009 to 2016, I introduced a system called CompStat. There was no deaths. There were no type of uh, uh, incidents like you're seeing today, and that's documented in the federal court records of when we ended the consent decree. So you can come back and look at that as evidence. So you would reintroduce would the do. program that you, you had? That will put back in Got place okay. what I put in place. JT, for you, what would, what, give me something specific. I'm, I'm praying. I would make sure that every deputy was jail certified so they know how to act in an emergency situation and also make sure that the deputies do 30 minute rounds and hold the supervisors accountable for those deputies doing the rounds to ensure the safety of everyone in that facility. Got it. Kurt? Higher, mass higher. 
ensure that we have enough staff there to oversee the detainees. You have to have them, you have to have staff hired and you have to ensure that they're properly trained and you need those levels of management in place. So if you have deputies, detention officers on the floor, we need to have a sergeant there to oversee to make sure that those rounds and everything that needs to be done to keep the detainees alive. You've got to hire, you've got to train, you've got to support. Okay, Pat, ever, you've heard people's ideas. What, what, do, what do you got? I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, what, what do you got? So first of all, uh, I'm equally as frustrated as you. And for anyone to not understand, one death is too many, absolutely. It was mentioned earlier with respect to whether it be chronic diseases or otherwise. What we have instituted is, look, I get a phone call at 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4.30 every morning to really have this conversation around how people are doing. What does that look like? Do we need more staffing? Absolutely. This is a decade upon decade long issue. There's 60 people that have perished, that have, have, have died inside, and you know this, inside Fulton County in the last 20 years. And so the assertion that uh, jail is, is, it's not supposed to happen. Ultimately, we have to understand until we build a new facility, until we change the culture, the culture right now, which we stepped into as an administration, it was simply hurting people, trying to get people to court, trying to get them to uh, back from court, et cetera. But if you look at what happens over at the Atlanta City Detention Center in a direct supervisional facility, in and of itself, provide safety for staff, provide safety for detainees as well. And so we have to change the culture. And it doesn't change overnight. And that's what we're focusing on is trying to figure out, one, how do we increase the staffing and provide even third party staffing in terms of the tower how support. How long is this going to take, like what for you, you know, you said one death is too many. But at a certain point, it's also too many for us to trust the leadership that might be in there. Uh, so how do we, uh, a genuine question, I, that was not a dig, it's a, it's a genuine question, right? Which is, it, if, if it's, is this something that, it, it, clearly the, the jail system itself, because, uh, and I'm going to get to you, Joyce, as well, to, to be able to chime in on this. The people who came right before you said that this is a staffing issue. Well, if you have a staffing issue, they're going to have a staffing issue. Like, then th th if they choose to resolve that, they'll choose to resolve that. What I'm trying to get at is if we reelect you in the next in the next year, what's going to be different? What like what's going to be different that we're not going to have another LaShawn? Like what 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 how do we know that that this is going to get better? So I'll give you a great example in partnership with the Board of Commissioners. The 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 death that you mentioned was out of the inability for us to provide the services. So two weeks later, and every two weeks, we partnered with a company that provides clinical cleaning for those that cannot take care of themselves. And every other month, we take the entire command staff and lay eyes on every individual that's there. Sit, have the conversations that need to, to take place. Is it unavoidable in terms of what people don't understand or, or choose not to understand, when you have a building that's out of life cycles, you know like I know, I took five wheelbarrows full of homemade knives to the Board of Commissioners. Because to an, an, an earlier panelist's point, we are not responsible for the maintenance. And to that, when, when detainees feel unsafe, they make weapons. And as many gangs as we have internal to the facility, we ultimately have to continue to do the things that we started to do, partner with the state, partner with other agencies. And, and, to, and to your point, you're absolutely right. And so those yeah. things now that we have in place will prevent some of the earlier okay. crisis. Joyce, for you, you've heard the, the sitting sheriff and then you've heard uh, four, three other people who want to be sheriff. For you, it, how are you going to solve this overcrowding issue and uh, not just the overcrowding issue but that people are dying inside of these facilities what what would that look like under your if you were if you were sheriff okay what that would look like for me is treating first the staff that's why the question is why are they so short why are the staff leaving due to the fact of not being treated right so if you treat staff right understand their needs 
they will come to work and we wouldn't be short staffed. But as far as all those deaths, they're not, other than LaShawn, the other ones wasn't natural causes. It was inmate on inmate. So in order for it to be inmate on inmate, that means individuals are not being accountable and they're not doing their job. So in order to prevent that, if you conduct your security round like you're supposed to, it, it wouldn't give the inmates time to, to create anything. And to continue to say that the people are dying because of the jail, the jail is not killing these people. It's inmates on inmates. So once you treat your staff right, treat them with respect, they will come to work, and they will be there to do the job. And other than natural causes, of course, we can't prevent that. But once, if we should discover someone have passed, the autopsy will determine on the cause of death as far as that. But one is too many. But once I staff it, treat the staff right, that will be a big step as far as preventing all of those deaths. I need to move us to Q&A, um, uh, so I'm going to move us to uh, audience Q&A. Um, as I'm getting the Q&A, um, the last thing that I want you to do on the whiteboards, um, oh, are you going to read them? Oh, uh, do I have them? Oh, Brittany's going to read them. Okay, cool. Um, so there's a uh, two, um, $2 billion jail uh, that has been proposed to be built. Um, is that something that you believe is a solution to the challenges that we talked about, and would you support the construction of a new facility at two billion dollars? Okay, we got no, no. One point seven billion. Okay, uh, okay, uh, but I presume that's a yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I just saw the yes. Uh, no, and absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, we're going to have Brittany Whaley, the regional director for the Working Families Party. She's <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, clap. Clap it up. Brittany's amazing. <laughs> so Brittany is going to go through the questions and read them. Rohit will decide who answers. And Chris will give you a mic when Rohit says you should answer. So we're gonna keep it short and sweet so we can get y'all out of here on time. Okay, the first, the first question is for Sheriff Labatt. Sheriff Labatt, you mentioned that third party staffing will be part of the solution to the understaffing crisis. For the record, could you disclose whether you have any ownership or interest in any companies that could provide or are currently providing such services? I think that question should go to Sheriff Labatt. <laughs> Absolutely not. I have no ownership interest in any part of any third party company. The next question, how much did Fulton County taxpayers spend on the neon uniforms and tricked out police vehicles? Um, so why don't you write down on your board what you think that total was? How much we spent on uniforms and what was it, tricked out uh, check, check. vehicles? Yeah. Got it. Noted. How much do you believe Fulton County spends on uniforms and tricked out vehicles. Okay, you could turn that around. Okay, you have 300,000 vehicles, 250 and uniform 7K. You said the cost the same budget Okay, it's, so you didn't spend anything different than was originally allocated. Uh, you wrote 20 million and you wrote 11 million. We'll do some fact checking later. Can you okay. just hold that up so the camera wanted to see it? Thank you, Kat. Appreciate it. Next question. 
The next question, what is the plan for homelessness peddling near, near the on and off ramps, and how do you plan to impact the neighboring communities concerning public unity? Okay, um, so this is a question about homelessness. Uh, Kurt, would you mind taking that question? Yes, I, as sheriff, I would like to get involved with um, Mayor Dickens and the efforts that he's putting forth. But being that we cannot deny anyone who's arrested and coming to the jail, if they happen to be arrested, I will look to try and make them better, get them involved in some of our life skill programs, uh, substance abuse and um, the literacy program, just to try and make them better to try and prevent them from going back out the same way in which they entered. Okay, next question. Have you read the UN's document titled Strategies to Reduce Overcrowding in Prisons? If so, what is one strategy that you believe could be useful in Fulton County? If you haven't read the document, what is one strategy in general that you believe could effectively reduce the prison population in Fulton County? So if you could write yes or no whether you've read that report and then you've already offered an answer to the question on reducing the population. Uh, no by Saab. Oh, say that again. Okay, got it. Okay, no, no. Uh, you said yes, no, and yes. So I'll bring this question to you since you're one of the people who uh, read the report. What is a strategy out of the report that you would implement into if you were elected sheriff? Yes, I've read it in part, uh, the UN report, but it really comes back to the state constitution of Georgia in dealing with speedy trials, and that also is a federal uh, constitutional amendment of getting people into courts. We have to get our judges, for those of you all who are present, judges, prosecutors, we've got to get them on the ball to relieve this overcrowding. I've said it in defense of all sheriffs, and I'll say it in defense of this sheriff and in defense of your next sheriff. Is, is that at the end of the day, the criminal justice system has to be balanced across the board. We don't need the UN. We don't need any people coming to tell us what we are supposed to do in the civil rights cradle of the United States and the world. So it really begins in our court setting the standard for the world like we did in 2009. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, we've heard some, some dehumanizing language this evening about those who are incarcerated. Will you lead by example, seeing and treating those who come to jail with respect, with decency, and with dignity? Uh, let's make that a yes or no question, and then I will actually ask a follow-up. Okay. Um, Joyce, what is for you uh, something that you believe you need more information on in order to better speak about uh, an incarcerated population or that others should know. Um, so it's either you should know or others should know to speak about those uh, who are inside of the jail systems differently. Okay, I believe that most of the overcrowdedness comes from homelessness and mental health. So for the ones that are having a mental health crisis, jail is not the place for them. So other than coming to the community, we working together as far as trying to address the homelessness and the mental health that will break down the overcrowdedness and they will be still treated with respect and dignity. Okay, thank you. Okay, Fulton County contracts with private for-profit healthcare companies to, with a track record, this has contributed to Fulton's crisis of preventable deaths while people are in custody. Do you support building and empowering external medical oversight of local physicians, public health practitioners with expertise in carceral systems in at the intersection of health? Okay, that's a yes or no. Okay. Uh, can you show, uh, Joyce, would you be able to show your response? It's great. 
All right, what type of support is needed from the Board of Commissioners? How can you improve relations between these departments? Okay, um, I am going to turn this question over to you, JT. Oh, could you uh, wait for the microphone, please? Can you remind us what number you wrote, one through five? I think it was uh, a three, three, right? Three. Yes. So maybe you could speak to that. Okay. While I was with the Sheriff's Office, I was elected to the Grievance Board. And what I learned was how to collaborate with the county commissioner and the county managers. So with that experience that I have, I will use that to collaborate with them to ensure that what I needed for the jail and for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, I would get. Thank you. Sheriff Labatt, why are men hoarded into holding tanks for hours and days when chairs are available? That question is for Sheriff Labatt. Well, first of all, thank you. Some of it has to do with staffing. Ultimately, that's why we started this initiative that allows me to have commanders reach out 9, 9, 3 o'clock, and 4.30 in the morning to better understand the ebb and flow of how we actually are processing people. Ultimately, the processing of individuals has caused this continued backlog. And so ultimately, as we improve staffing, we improve the positions of where they are in the facility and actually get them to a housing unit more readily. To Brown, explain your experience managing a large number of law enforcement officers. Uh, wait one second for a microphone. Sorry about that, anxious. Um, I was in the training division and I was a certified trainer. So I trained a number of command staff and other agencies while I was there with the sheriff's office. I also was a field training officer while I was at the sheriff's office. I trained the young deputies after they got out of mandate on how to conduct themselves in different divisions. And I worked every division and I was a field training officer in each division, the jail division, the court division, and the law enforcement division. So that role was very important. And the number of people that I trained went up the rank to become majors and commanders at the sheriff's office. And one of them right now is um, Antonio Johnson, I trained him. Thank you. Okay, to Farmer, have you ever managed a budget of 80 million or more such as required at the Fulton County Jail? To answer the question, no, I haven't managed that budget. However, that's where it would come in place of me hiring expertise to do that part. Okay. Um, what do what do each of you think you can do better than the current sheriff and why? Okay, uh, let's. It feels unfair to have one person answer that. If you can quickly say one specific thing that you would change, that you would do differently, one specific thing, um, that would be uh, that. That's where we'll start. Okay, go ahead. First and foremost, it will be leading by expertise. As the foremost subject matter expert in the Office of Sheriff, I lead by constitutional and Office of Sheriff uh, uh, responsibilities, and it has been demonstrated uh, since my career inside of the Sheriff's Office. Got it. Can you pass it to Choice, please? What I would do different is to treat the staff with respect and dignity, as well as ensuring that people are promoted within the system that we mentioned earlier without be just volunteering and you're promoted. That's not, I'm not going to do that. So they're going to earn the promotion versus it being given. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind helping me pass that over to Kurt. Okay, thank you. As sheriff, I will lead by example. I will accept responsibility, full responsibilities for the duties of sheriff. And I will work directly with the staff, letting them know that I'm in this fight with them. Okay. I would implement a system of training to all my deputies in each division. So let me specify that. 
If you are in the jail division, you will be jail certified. If you're in the court division, you will be court certified. If you're in the law enforcement division, you will have the necessary training so you can go out there and execute it, execute a warrant lawfully. Now that's important because if you have an untrained officer, they can go out there and commit a crime themselves. So the more training they have, say like a crisis intervention officer, which I was, I was the first crisis intervention officer with the sheriff's office. I was the first crisis intervention trainer. All my deputies also would be crisis intervention certified so we can handle mentally challenged uh, um, Thank detainees you. also. All right, everyone, let's give it up for the candidates. Let's thank our amazing moderator. Um, again, thank you to each of you for taking the time out this evening to be here. Um, so just a quick, quick wrap up, right? Um, this shouldn't be the end. We hope that you continue to be involved and stay involved. Our website is ACLUGA.org. Again, I want to thank all of our partners, Center for Civic Innovation, for those great handouts on your seat. Yeah. Um, Southern Center for Human Rights, Working Families Party, Changing the Face of Justice, BMI Georgia, Black Men Build, 100 Black Men of Atlanta, the Ada Landa Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> Gate City Bar and Capital B. So hold on, hold on. We have one quick last thing from Chris, and I promise you we're out of here. Everyone, before we do leave, I want to give it up for somebody who was the brainchild of this, Fallon McClure. Uh, putting on these type of forums is not easy at all. So on behalf of our executive director, Andrea Young, I'm Chris Bruce, Policy and Advocacy Director. Thank you for coming out. This is not the end of it. Uh, voting starts. Talk to the candidates afterwards, and have a good day. <laughs>